Now, here's where I should probably talk about. Okay. So a lot of people, especially when writing queer theories, they narrativize um, Alexander and Cletus as lovers. And I think it's entirely possible. I mean, it's like that meme of like, you know, oh, and they were roommates. You know, historians shall know them as roommates. We call them friends, but, you know, do I think that they fucked? entirely possible entirely plausible and people sort of write alexander the great as like a, a as as gay the history of heterosexuality and homosexuality is fairly recent we're talking in the last two to three hundred years the idea that sexual act determines sexual identity does not necessarily appear in the throughout history as in the terms that we understand it today but i think i can simplify it by saying that there is a difference between a history of same-sex relations and a history of homosexuality but I think it is perfectly plausible to say that Alexander preferred the company of men than to women. We do see this theme sort of emerge subtly through the text. And we can create parallels. We can do what is known as reclaiming history, which is a fairly ahistorical, not necessarily uh, academically sound practice of taking histories and relating it to our own lives to draw out the things that we want. The history of witchcraft is a great example of this. People, especially like modern day neo-pagans and many like second wave feminists have reclaimed the idea of the witch as a symbol of female empowerment. The actual history is far, far more complicated and it really doesn't hand hold up to that kind of narrativization. But there is value because at the end of the day, Alexander is dead and he is never coming back. And while historians have an ethical and professional obligation to report the facts as they actually are, the average person on the street does not. And if you want to claim Alexander as a gay icon, then like, go for it. Personally, and I suspect that yourself as well, having heard some of the uh, quite uh, brutal massacres he officiated over and his um, increasing instability, uh, I feel like there are better people we can claim. Nonetheless, it is a desire. It is a natural thing we have to look back through the past and say, you know, ut erimus et fuimus, as it was, so it shall be. We want to find images of ourselves deep in the past, and that gives us legitimacy in the present. It's something that pretty much every civilization has done. Medieval chroniclers drew, uh, drew people in contemporary fashion so they could see themselves reflected in the past. But you know me. My philosophy, por que no los dos? Why can't we have both? We can accept Alexander as a queer icon in a, in a tongue-in-cheek way while simultaneously acknowledging that he was kind of a piece of shit. But without, you know, cancelling him. Why do our gay icons all have to be good people? He certainly was a complex man, born into an extraordinarily unstable position of incredible privilege. And personally, I don't feel a great deal of sympathy for him in that state, but it is certainly interesting. It is certainly interesting. And he, even today, he is a man that more books have been written about him than perhaps any other person in history. He is the most studied man in history. So the man Alexander, 
Not only is he dead and gone and never coming back so we don't have to worry about hurting his feelings by misrepresenting him, but he is already lost to history. There is no more Alexander. There is only a series of mythologies and that is the man that he built by being able to adopt and control mythologies. He un seemed to understand that the narrative was the way to immortality. And he, you know, he is the historian's king. No small wonder that he is so narrativized that everybody wants to claim him as their own. Personally, I think it is a little reductive to equate our modern sensibilities onto the past. And I think it's important to be critical of these things. I remember my sister, when she was in high school, she wrote like a history of gay people. And she sort of started with Alexander the Great. And when I, I said to her, I was studying history at university at the time. She was in high school. And I said to her, you realize like same sex relationships and, and homosexuality aren't the same thing. And she just got like really shitty at me. In, you know, a passive-aggressive, rather an aggressive way or anything, but, um... It's kind of how it is. People get very attached to our stories. And being an historian... God, you better believe, historians in Australia have been, like, followed by spy agencies to make sure that they're not, you know, perverting national narratives by writing about socialism and... Historians receive death threats, and it's kind of an extension of the culture war. So I guess what I'm trying to say, on one hand, is that history is, studying history is one of the most important pursuits we can have. And on the other hand, we have to understand that what we're dealing with here, although we deal with the best historical sources, we can often, the truth is not what is on the pages, but what is between the pages once things that we become better able to draw out of the narrative once we are familiar with the patterns of narrativization and this is a constantly evolving process what my generation creates yours will tear down and question and then out of the ashes of what is left do you find the things that work best for you then that we find a truth and that is the truth that is best for the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And that's a fairly technocratic proceduralist perspective, but it is one that we'll do, that we'll do for now. Because I can't do justice to every philosophical approach, at least right now. At least not in a diversion, when I'm meant to be speaking about Alexander the Great. So, TLDR, Alexander the Great, gay or nah? Technically, nah, but does it really matter? Alexander the Great, fuck dudes, almost certainly. I mean, probably everybody did, right? I mean, if you really want to get technical about it, homosexuality predates heterosexuality. It's like, you know, like, which came first, safety or danger? Well, why we need a term for safety if we don't have a term for danger? Anyway, moving on. His father was probably Alexander's most influential role model, as I said, was the young Alexander watching him campaign practically every year, winning victory after victory while ignoring severe wounds. Okay, a little bit of narrativizing happening here. I very much doubt he was ignoring severe wounds, but he was certainly putting an affectation of strength, um, of, you know, probably... I would suspect absolutely domineering and terrifying the young Alexander. His mother had huge ambitions as well. Yeah, as evidenced by the amount of people she had killed just to secure their lineage. And encouraged her son to believe it was his destiny to conquer the Persian Empire. She instilled a sense of destiny in him. Mm, they got some narrativization here. We don't know what is in his head, but, you know, these are... These are fine. This is fine. I don't really see a problem with this. 
and Plutarch tells how his ambition kept his spirit serious and lofty in advance of his years. I mean, to be fair, he didn't have that many years anyway. Alexander had a violent temper and rash, impulsive nature. I believe it. Desire for knowledge, a love of philosophy, and an avid reader. No doubt due to Aristotle's tutelage. Yeah, Aristotle was kind of like an insufferable prat in a way. He would have been like one of... He's kind of like, like, like one of the worst debate bros you could imagine. I'm probably going to get some classical history people getting mad at me for this, but um, yeah, that's how I see it. So, no wonder he would uh, raise such a brat as Alexander. He had great self-restraint in pleasures of the body, in contrast with his lack of self-control with alcohol. Yeah, that was written in 1976. I can see some... some... anti-gay panic narrativization there. I have no evidence to suggest that except for a counter-narrative, but it is, uh... Yeah, let's leave that one hanging. He had no interest in the Olympic Games, unlike his father. Yeah, for him, games was like killing people. During his final years, and especially after the death of Hephaestion, I would say leading back to his first war injuries, the dispelling of the idea that he was like sort of immortal and also his conquering Persia and his not life sort of not immediately falling into a, into a kind of a perfection that would have... That would have fucked him up. I mean, this is a dude who was raised to think that his destiny was all leading to a single point. And when that point arrives, obviously he is not going to find... Obviously, when that point arrives, he is going to find that his insecurities and his fears and his inadequacies still exist. So Alexander, megalomania and paranoia. I totally believe it. I don't think that these are traits that emerged. I think it's far more likely that this is, this is his personality. The megalomania was instilled in him from birth. And the paranoia, that was a deep trauma instilled in him by the insecurity of his position in life. You see, he, you know, fled his father's empire and damn near joined with his enemies just over a few drunken insults. I mean, to be fair, that, that was some pretty serious business. As we've seen with Alexander, a few drunken insults can lead to people getting killed. But yeah, dude was a complicated, messed up man. And it's kind of tragic in a way. I mean, he's kind of running from his problems his whole life by running towards his accomplishments. That's how I read this. He is described by various sources as having boundless ambition. That's certainly the nicest way you could put it. Frequently, our ambitions and such are representatives, are expressions of our deeply held internal insecurities. He appears to have believed himself a deity or sought to deify himself, and yet he's kept his body kept being pierced by spears and his soul kept being damaged by the deaths and the betrayals of his friends and his heart kept being broken. And in the middle of the night, he would wake up probably to growing stomach pains over years and years of drinking and he would wake up each morning after debauchery and drinking to find himself a weak sick man so yeah that's that's alexander the great the most written about man in history honestly i kind of feel sorry for him I mean, I feel sorry for him, but at the same time, I don't really have sympathy for him, if that's, if you know what I mean. He was a bad dude. 
I mean, he had to be a bad dude. He was born into a world of murder and assassination and insecurity and, you know, he kind of had to be a bad dude to survive. He kind of managed to weave the stories of history and to turn bad into badass. And these things are separated only by a paper-thin distinction. Perhaps bad isn't the right narrative frame. He was weak. He was weak and he was fearful. And his fear drove him to be courageous. And his weakness drove him to be strong. Just like... Just like everybody else. Just like you or I. Sure, we don't conquer half the known world. But given the opportunity, maybe we would. So that's my take. That's my take of a close-up of the icon that is Alexander the Great. He's even got the kind of sad face here. Look at that. Is he an anime character? Like, look at the size of those eyes. I don't think an anime character has ever had a nose this big, though. Oh, except maybe for a One Piece character. But anyway, anyway. From here, onwards and upwards. And we'll be continuing these research streams. Working our way ever so slowly down the list. And thank you so much for coming. I love you all so very much. And swoop swoop, take care of one another.